So having discussed what's called the cosmological argument for God, uh, various versions of that, uh, I'm now coming on to what's called the ontological argument. There are actually several versions of that. The, it was first introduced quite a long time ago, even before uh, Thomas Aquinas I was talking about last time. It was introduced by Anselm, St. Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century, in a book called The Proslogion, written about 1077. The label ontological is not actually Anselm's. It was introduced many centuries later by Immanuel Kant. But it, it's become the standard way of referring to this type of argument. It comes, ontological comes from the Greek word for being or essence. And it refers to an argument which really just reflects on the essence or nature or definition of God. So it's quite unlike the arguments I was discussing earlier, which are about causes or looking around in the universe and finding chains of causes and things. It's rather just focusing at an abstract level on what we mean by God, just on the essence or definition of God. So it's uh, what philosophers sometimes call a purely a priori argument. It's quite independent of any observation or experience. It's prior to experience. And Anselm starts from a quotation from the Psalms, uh, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Why is it foolish to say there's no God? Well, Anselm suggesting that really the fool is, if he did but know it, is contradicting himself. Because God cannot be said or thought not to exist if this argument's valid. Well, you might say, why on earth not? Lots of people are atheists. They say God doesn't exist. And even if they're wrong, there's certainly no contradiction in saying uh, God isn't around. Um, but this is the way Anselm argues it. He says, let's start from what we mean by God. We mean by God that than which nothing greater can be conceived. God is traditionally thought of as the most perfect being. Not just the most perfect being you can conceive of, but something even beyond your conception. In a way, God is this infinite idea so that uh, no matter which, uh, no matter how far you try to define or encompass him, he's always infinitely beyond that. Um, so he's greater than anything you can imagine or think of. If you thought you'd, as it were, boxed up God, uh, and got him um, sorted out, that would be the best evidence that you hadn't really found God you just found an idol of your own invention. So that's just the point of definition. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Now there are only two possibilities, reasons and so on. Either this being exists really, there really is a God, or he exists just as a figment in your imagination, just as an idea in the minds of deluded believers. So that's the dilemma. And then he reasons, but wait a minute, if he exists merely in the understanding, merely in the mind, then he's not the greatest thing you can conceive of. Well, why not? Because you can conceive of something much greater than just being in your mind, namely a being who's really out there who really has power, who really exists. So once you define God as this greatest, the, the being than which nothing greater can be conceived, it follows that he must exist, not just in your understanding, but really and actually. And therefore, God exists. It's, it's, in a way, it's a kind of maddening argument. It's infuriated some people. It's convinced others. 
fact, even the uh, famous atheist Bertrand Russell at one time thought the argument was valid. Um, well, here's some, just quickly, some possible objections. Why should we think of this definition of God in the first place? Why start from that? Well, I think Anselm, or someone might reply on Anselm's behalf, we don't have to, but once you do think of that concept, then it follows that it must exist, that God must really exist. Um, and actually, the definition isn't arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. It corresponds to, I think, what most people intuitively think of as what God means. God means this infinite being, the being than which we can't think of anything greater. A lot of people say, and this is a second objection, well, definitions tell us about concepts. They can't tell us about what really exists. Um, well, Descartes, René Descartes, who discussed this argument, he had his own version of it much later, compared this to mathematical property, like a triangle. Um, he said, sure, your thought doesn't make things true, but it, consider a triangle. Once you start with a definition of a triangle, you, you can see certain things have got to be true of it. Its angles equal 180 degrees, for example. Your thought doesn't make that true. It's just, it follows from the nature, the definition of a triangle. So similarly, if this argument's valid, it's not that I'm making it true in my thought that God exists. It's rather that his existence follows from the definition of God. Some people have objected the argument circular. Look, you're really just already assuming that God exists. But I, I personally think that's an unfair objection. We can talk about things without assuming they exist. I can talk about Father Christmas or unicorns and ask, well, what is the essential definition of a unicorn? Answer, it has four legs and one horn and various other properties. So I can talk about that without committing myself, without begging the question, as they say, without being circular and assuming that it exists. Indeed, I can say, actually, unicorns don't exist. They're just fictitious. So I can talk about God without begging the question of his existence. But the defender of the argument is going to say, but in this, unlike unicorns and other objects which may or may not exist, once I think about this definition of God, I'll realize that it entails his existence. The very definition entails that he must actually exist. Why should it be greater to exist in the understand, to exist in reality than just in someone's mind? Well, I think a possible reply to that, or I think this is something, it's not as if there are final answers to this question, is the ontological argument valid? It's something I think everyone has to think about and reflect on. But one reason for thinking it's more perfect to really be around the place is that if you're real and really exist, you can do things which fictitious beings can't. For example, if Santa Claus really exists, then he could perhaps give presents to people. Whereas if he's just a figment of someone's imagination, he can't. Santa Claus can't uh, take round presents. So by analogy there, if God is the greatest being, he, he's got to be powerful, and he wouldn't be powerful if he was just invented fictitious being. There is a more worrying objection, I think, which was first voiced by Immanuel Kant in the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, which is that existence is not a predicate. This is quite a technical objection, but really he was objecting to saying that existence is one of the things you can list as a property of God alongside, say, being merciful or just or powerful. 
existence is not a property like that. It doesn't tell you about something. Rather, it introduces something. Like the French, il y a. There is something such that. And then you can go on to mention the predicates or properties. So according to this objection, there's a kind of trick in the argument. It's treating existence as if it was one of these properties, whereas actually it's just a way of introducing something. And um, in a way, I think Aquinas, who I mentioned earlier, um, was onto this sort of, incidentally, Aquinas rejected the ontological argument, although he produced many other arguments for God. And he said, really, at best, the argument's hypothetical. It says that if anything qualifies as God, then it would have to exist. But it leaves it open whether anything does qualify for God in the first place.